you've become somebody who is changing the world. Was, was that always an ambition? I don't think explicitly, but I always, um, and I think it's hard to establish why one is like one is, but I've always wanted to put right what's wrong. So I was always somebody that would challenge things. Um, I never sort of accepted the status quo. And uh, sometimes that could be uh, unhelpful, perhaps, but um, in context of doing something like in improving gender equality, then hopefully that's been a good thing. How, how would you change the world? It's not as simple mm. as equality, is it? No, I mean, obviously, uh, I think we got used to centuries where effectively one very small proportion of humanity really has lorded it over the, the others. Um, and that might sound a bit unkind. I'm not anti, you know, white affluent men at all, but actually it's odd when we think about it that so many of the top jobs, whether it's business, politics, in, in our communities are, are held by and have always been really, as far as anyone can remember, today anyway, held by just one narrow group of people with very few exceptions. And I suppose my concept is more the big rebalance or re big balance, because we haven't ever had it before, but to actually really shift things, not from being just about more opportunities for women, but for men to have more choices too, that perhaps they often feel, I think, straitjacketed by societal expectations. And we should, in today's world where there's lots of equal education opportunities, shake that up. So change the whole world of work and what's expected yeah. of you at work. Definitely. Um, and I think, you know, we've got great opportunity now with technology, um, which we're not really, we're only scratching the surface of the capabilities uh, to change things. And people I've seen, you know, they get used to things and don't challenge and question. But actually, uh, I'm interested in you know, us sharing as men and women together, both careers, um, bringing up families, life, rather than being rather sharply delineated between men do one thing and women do another. You're often held up as a role model for, for girls. How much is there really to learn from your career path? I mean, what, what's your story? I mean, how did you get where you are? So I think there's lots of accidents in my own career. And one thing that I always encourage young girls and women to, to think about is not feeling that they need to plan every stage of the way or to be too fearful about what might go wrong. In fact, I now look back on my younger self and think for a while, at least, I was nervous about um, well, being my true self, really. And I felt I needed to toe the line. I needed to fit in to get a seat at the table. Whereas now I see, actually, we can be bolder and each of us can make something of an impact on how things evolve. But the other big thing really has been um, having mentors and allies, particularly, I'll be honest, male allies. Um, and I think that's definitely been a hallmark of the 30% Club, which is all about sort of chairmen, and usually they are men. Uh, when we started, 99 out of the top 100 chairmen in this country um, were men. Um, and it hasn't really changed much in the last decade. But it's really important to have people in power campaigning for those who are outside of it, and that's how you make a difference. Did, but in terms of rising up from being a, mm. you know, an entry-level banker after university, did you have to you know, use the system? Did you have to befriend powerful men? Did you have to play the game in any way, you know, make allies? Were you, were you a politician? Well, not consciously at first, actually. Um, in my first job, and I've said this many times, and I feel almost embarrassed because that company has changed um, immeasurably since, but when I joined a very traditional, um, as it was then, a merchant bank in the city, shows how old I am, um, then I had my first child. Uh, I was the only woman in a team of 16. I was a fixed income fund manager at the time and um, very male bastion. And um, when I came back from maternity leave, I was passed over for promotion. And when I asked, oh, what did I need to do differently next time? Um, the answer came straight back. Oh, nothing's wrong with your performance, but there is some doubt over your commitment with a baby. Now, that was a, a shock to me, I'll be honest. But it was a totally normal thing to say to women. In, that, in those days, in those yes. Days. I mean, it was before we had, you know, legislation that prevented people from actually saying that. They might think it, though. But then they said it. And I knew where I stood, at least. Um, and I did leave that company. Uh, but I learned from that, obviously, not just to put your head down, work hard, wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder, give you a promotion or a pay rise. And I did consciously then, in my next company, um, you know, make sure that I asked for that seat at the table, asked, you know, when there was an interesting committee or group that had been joined, you know, perhaps I could offer something. And if it was legitimate, if I really had something to offer, usually the answer was yes. And that was a lesson for me. And, and over time, I realised that actually I didn't have to, I certainly didn't have to behave like a, like a man, I didn't have to be an honorary man to get that position. Actually, over time, it became clearer to me that my differences were what 
probably made me stand out in the end. And that's the other advice I give young women. But I suppose what you might say from those early years of you of you rising up is that you were you were leaning in. Yeah, uh, and you know, I, Cheryl, I think... what Cheryl Sandberg calls leaning in, and what you've now come to criticise a bit. Well, I, I think at that stage, um, obviously this was predating a lot of the campaigning efforts or any uh, visibility around gender pay gap or calculation of numbers of women on boards and so forth. And um, I do think it was a different era uh, than we have today. I think we have got a very different opportunity now, but then definitely I lent in um, and that perhaps that was the only way to progress. And I think women of my generation, I'm 52, um, did do that, um, but it doesn't actually make you happy necessarily if you're submerging, you know, what's really, you know, yourself. And I feel that women often have had to be like honorary men um, to succeed, and that my big perception, really, or my main perception, is that now I don't think we either have to or must. I actually think it's really important that we contribute to better workplaces, better businesses by being ourselves. A lot of women um, in I was going to say your era, our era, um, mm -hmm. who went into the city in those days didn't last. You know, they had their first child and maybe went back to work. And then after the second child, maybe that was it. They gave up. What, why, why did you stay the course? Why did you keep going where mm -hmm. others decided to leave? So I'll be honest, the, in the first instance, it was very much necessity. So I know it's hard to believe when we've got almost zero interest rates, but, you know, interest rates when we bought our first flat in uh, South London were 15% briefly. And, um, you know, we had neg negative equity. We needed both of myself and my husband um, to, to earn a full-time uh, salary. And then my husband was made redundant and I became the main breadwinner. He went back to work, um, found another role. Um, but then when we had our fourth child, it was all very stressful, um, and he volunteered to go freelance. He was a journalist. So you didn't really so have a choice? I didn't know. have a choice. And actually, I'm quite grateful for that now, because I do see some of my peers having a choice and actually then not regretting it, because obviously it's a hugely important task to br bring up a family, and, and, it's, and I'm not wanting to denigrate that at all. But then there's no route back in for them, um, which they should be. These are very talented women. Um, whereas I actually feel, well, I just had to plow on. And by the time I got so I was what in the eyes of the world would have been deemed successful, then, um, you know, I'd had the very hard years when you are really struggling with small babies and obviously, in my case, rather a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, you, you said you were discriminated against very early on. Mm. I mean, were you, were you bullied? Were you sexually harassed? Did you have any of those sorts of things? Well, um, there, was, there, was, there was some which I'd... I mean, it's so long ago now that I don't want to dredge over the, the colds, really, but um, it was more that it was everyday sort of banter, as people would describe it now. So we, people would discuss over the desk, you know, going to lap dancing clubs with clients and so forth. And, and you know, if you're the only woman there, it's, it's very uncomfortable. Um, and I'm not prudish, and I'm sort of not what somebody to, you know, try to be militant and say, you know, that they have to behave in a certain way. I wanted to be in the group as well. I didn't want to be ostracized by the group, but it was it was not a pleasant environment. And we're talking now 30 years ago uh, when I first started, and I want anybody who's listening and watching this to realize that it has changed a lot in the city now. They still go lap dancing, don't they? Well, <laughs> they don't tell me about it now. So, um, and, and I'm not saying it's perfect. I mean, it's, in no way is it perfect, but actually companies now, they really get, uh, and, the, and they haven't actually got the numbers to show for it yet in terms of numbers of women or numbers of ethnic minorities or, or anything like that. But they, there is an intent, a realization that if you have diversity of thought, different types of people, and not just one, then you're gonna have a more innovative environment. When did you realize that you didn't have to play the same game as the men in the same way, and that actually you had different talents, and that women have different talents you know, in, in different roles, which can bring something new to the party. Well, Stuart Newton, who founded Newton Investment Management, which is where I became the CEO up until quite recently, he became a mentor uh, of mine. And just to contrast with that first experience where I was discriminated against, once when I announced, and I can say this, yet another pregnancy, one of my colleagues said very loudly within earshot, deliberately so, um, oh, I can't believe she's pregnant again. Whereupon Stuart turned to him and said, oh, don't worry, she comes back better each time. Now, I'm, I'm afraid that wasn't strictly true. It was a very generous remark. But just imagine how it made me feel that, you know, Stuart was very clear that actually my differences, including having a large family and needing to sort of really focus my time at work so I could see them, was actually part of what made me me. And I never felt 
that I had to um, pretend that my whole family life didn't exist. And as I became more confident about that, then of course I became you know, better at my job, to be honest. Um, I could just be myself. And then my colleagues would ask me to present to clients and I just got a better career out of it. When the company was taken over, again, long time ago, um, uh, 2001, I became the chief executive. And although it was never articulated in exactly these terms, I think I was chosen partly because my style of leadership was, was I would describe, quite feminine. I would uh, try to build a consensus, try to connect with my colleagues. And I didn't feel that I knew all the answers, that together we were stronger. I do think that's something that women often well, they, we often operate like that. And, and I think it's very complementary to a perhaps more command and control uh, style of leadership. And together, we're better than either. Some people think men and women are the same. Some people think they have different qualities. You're more towards the second side? Yes, and I think it's quite strange that it's quite controversial a subject now, because obviously I'm believing in our equality, but I, I think it's a very big part of diversity that we are different. Um, and I sometimes joke that with the nine children, six girls and three boys, I have enough of a sample size to have done my own <laughs> social experiment. And, um, you know, and these aren't... I'm not saying that every woman is like a certain way and every man's like as another way. Uh, obviously, there's there's very empathetic men and there's very systematic women, and and those are the two sort of labels that are often put in terms of our natural tendencies. But I do think our biology pays quite a part. Um, you know, we're slightly programmed into even just in terms of even if we don't have children, we're programmed to be nurturing a little bit. And I think um, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. I mean, that's and then by uh, hormones. Obviously, there's sometimes the joke made that. Uh, if we had Lehman sisters, we wouldn't have had the financial crisis. And of course, we'll never know. But a lot of academic research has been done into the fact that, you know, men produce 10 times the amount of testosterone as women. And testosterone makes you sort of take more risk as you as you win. Um, and I definitely think, you know, there's lots of studies that show that women and men, it results in a less risky environment. So, so you, you think, think the financial should... crisis was caused by men and, and male characteristics? And you're well, in the I, I, um, I guess if I'm pushed to pin against the wall and say yes or no, then it would be a yes. Um, and that's why the 30% Club was born as well, because people realised afterwards that, you know, having one type of person sort of in charge couldn't possibly be the optimal team. You're not in favour of quotas, are you? No. You know, or, or sort of changing the law to force people to do th these things? No. Well, why not? Well, to be honest, what I'm trying to do is, is in some ways, um, let's say, bring the feminine qualities and the masculine qualities together. And actually, by um, imposing a quota, by having a very more militant, confrontational approach, saying you have to do this, I think that's quite a sort of old-fashioned way of going about. I would rather have hearts and minds. It takes longer that way, but I think the track record of what's happened in women on boards in this country, uh, we went from... 12.5% um, women on FTSE company boards, the top 100 listed companies in 2010, to 28.9% now, uh, sort of tortuously close to 30%. It's going to go up now by 0.1s, I think, in every six months. But I think we show that voluntary change does work. And, I, and of course, I am not just interested in women on boards. This is much broader. This is about women having better opportunities at all levels. Of and, and do you think 30%, the 30% club should become the 50% club or the 51% club? So, well, it's, it's, that one's quite difficult because, I, first of all, I don't think, I mean, it's become a sort of a bit of a brand for equality rather than actually, um, or a good intent to have better balance rather than uh, the precise number. So there are members of the 30% club that have 40% women on their boards. It's not a sort of test. And once you're through it, you can sort of drop off. Um, but actually, I do uh, feel that it's less about, to be honest, women on boards now than it is about that broader issue in society. And it is about making sure that we don't just tackle gender, but also uh, we're quite holistic about it. And I mean, in the fund management industry, we have very poor track record in, in hiring from anything other than very traditional backgrounds. So, so true diversity. True diversity. I mean, I think women's a start because it's so obvious being 50% of the population or 51. Um, but obviously the hope is that we go beyond 30 and it just becomes normal just as, you know, 10% now would be looked at strange and a sign of being rather backwards. And then we'll recalibrate what's the norm and then move on further. But, I mean, do, do you feel that something has changed this year? You know, that there's a, there's a much greater impatience, it seems, this year as a result of the Me Too campaign, the Weinstein revelations, and the revelations about gender pay gaps. 
and, um, and it's changed the debate in quite a dramatic way. I, I just wonder whether it's made you think your own ambitions are too modest. Well, I think this is our moment to seize. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of attention on the whole gender equality issue. A lot of it's quite uh, a lot of anger. But I argue that actually this uh, uh, avalanche of, of bad news has actually been just revelations about behaviours and practices that have been going on for many years. What's different is that we know about them now. And often you see, I mean, obviously the Harvey Weinstein went from hero for decades in Hollywood to zero in a matter of hours. So you have swift action um, and it's changing the pace. Um, I don't think I'm being uh, too modest. I mean, you could say it's too modest around the 30 percent. But actually, if one's saying we want a whole rebalancing of society and we want um, boys and girls to grow up with expectations about their roles that are very different from their parents' generations, I think that's a big leap forward um, for humanity, not just uh, for, for gender equality. But do you think it's being achieved? I, I, was, I was here talking to Jermaine Greer a few days ago, and she's very, very sceptical about mm. it. You know, she, feels, she feels, first of all, that equality is not a desirable goal, uh, because men and women are different, you know, and in that you agree. Um, but she, you know, she also feels that not very much is being actually achieved. Um, so what's really going to change? So I think, I mean, clearly there's no sort of uh, overnight answer, uh, but I did see the pace of change massively shift forwards when we had um, the breakthrough of realisation on boards, at least. I mean, I'm, I'm not arguing that was the, in any way comparable to the whole, but it gave me a lot of uh, confidence that actually you, can, you don't need to extrapolate the past and you can't necessarily see the change that you're on the cusp of until you're over the other side. And I do feel pretty confident now. I think we do have to see this current moment for what it is, that it's not we've gone backwards and we need to have a gender war mentality. It's actually that lots of men want equality and they're coming uh, to our sides too and actually together we can change things. There are people doing, not just me obviously, but very concrete things as well. Um, but for example, the President's Club dinner, um, that obviously was very salacious um, allegations about that earlier in the year. Uh, you know, the fund management industry is now putting a series of events together to raise the money for the charities that have either lost out from this year's dinner or would lose out next year's dinner, and also supporting more inclusive um, charities throughout the country. And it's amazing to see. I mean, I think if that idea had been raised five years ago, even, I mean, not talking about decades, people have said, well, what's it got to do with us? I mean, that happened there, and is it really our responsibility? Whereas now people say, yes, we, we want to show that we're different and we are different, and then... You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's equivalent to having equality and gen no gender pay gaps in our own firm, but it's all part of a big continuum now. Um, and I, I think Jermaine Greer is wrong, and I'm, I'm hoping to um, prove her wrong. <laughs> so. It does bring me back to the question of how much of a role model you are, because, you know, you, your life seems really unusual and quite unique. You've got this big family, you have a husband who stays at home and looks after um, the children. You earn lots of money, so you can afford staff um, and that's a great life but it's not one to which many people can aspire is it in truth so I, I want to set the record straight on on this one because um, and I'm not saying this out of false modesty I'm I think I'm a very ordinary person from a pretty ordinary background I mean I had a very happy childhood um, but my daughters my parents are both teachers my sister's a teacher I went to comprehensive school actually which has been a very important part of my uh, my experiences I think um, co-ed school and I've I guess I've just developed my career not from some grand vision but actually just sort of taking one step uh, at a time and perhaps testing the boundaries of my capabilities perhaps more than some people might do um, and so I want to encourage other people to think not that you can be because I don't like the tag superwoman because I do think it puts me on a pedestal that I don't really belong on um, and actually we are there are lots of superwomen and supermen um, some of whom you know achieve what might be regarded as great uh, things in the world and others who are just doing wonderful things day in day out by their family or in their jobs um, or for each other and so I just think there are lots of different ways to live lives and I would hope that people would take some encouragement that I you know, I, I'm, I'm not distinct in lots of ways. Um, I've just got more children, perhaps, and, you know, maybe a, a, a bigger job title. But it's not something that I think is um, unattainable. But you, I mean, you probably are being modest because, you, you know, you've got to the top and not everybody can get to the top by definition. Um, so I, I wonder what you think the lessons are from what you've learned getting to the top 
or people who were lowered down the pecking order and who were, who were not particularly looking to get to the top because it's not particularly within their, their view. Well, I think a lot of the time we are paralysed or at least um, distracted by the fear of what might go wrong. And I, I remember when I was um, invited to teach a business school class. I've never even I've never been to business school, so this was quite a revelation for me. Where they were talking about the case study that was the thirty percent club, and during the course of this class, uh, the students were asked to come up with um, the, the things that might not work. This was before the sharing the story, and they came up between them with fifty seven different pitfalls uh, for this idea. And to be honest, if I'd listened to that before starting the 30% Club, probably would never have got off the ground. And some of the things did go wrong that they foresaw as problems. Um, but actually, I'm glad, you know, that, that I didn't worry about it. And I do think sometimes we have to look harder at the objective or focus harder at the objective. Obviously, there are setbacks. And dealing with defeat and dealing with setbacks, dealing with disappointments, has been a big part of my story. Not something I've always had the strength within myself to do. I've needed friends, my husband, allies to encourage me. But that is part of any labyrinth, as I call it, to the top. I mean, it's, there's not a ladder. It's back and forth. So if, if, you, if you don't believe in quotas and, and believe in persuasion and changing hearts and minds, um, what, what, is sort of the, what, what is it you're trying to achieve? You know, what, what is the next step of persuasion that you think you need to tackle? So it is rethinking the world of work. I mean, I think we've got to move away from the idea of, of gender equality or any kind of um, diversity initiatives as initiatives. This is about actually how do we structure and run businesses so that we are bringing out the best in all the talent that we employ and also making sure that we're not just stuck in the past um, or relatedly not just stuck in the past in terms of how we work. So a lot of people talk about flexible working or agile working, but actually most of us use technology in a very um, sort of basic way. For example, we have long hours at the desk at, at, in the office and then we go home and we log on and do some more emails, which just extends our day and makes us more exhausted. Um, whereas actually, in all honesty, we can do a lot of work from any, time, any place in the world. And um, I think the next generation expects that. They are used to making an intellectual contribution or any kind of contribution, um, often remotely. And uh, businesses need to adapt quite quickly. So for example, making all roles, wherever possible, open to agile working. And it's not about being nice to women. It's about allowing everybody to not have to be exhausted by the long commute. Um, it's about engagement um, and making people more productive because they're happier. I mean, could, could your team work from home? I well, mean, because a lot of financial institutions say, well, we're different. We need everybody on the floor. You know, we've got all sorts of rules that we need to obey, yeah. so we've got to be more traditional. No, we have introduced agile working, and actually some people for a while have worked from home, and always if someone says, actually, I'm working on a presentation, or what my favourite line is when they say, actually, I really need to get some stuff done, so I'm going to work from home. We're, I think the key is to measure outputs um, because obviously, again, this is not about presenteeism and how long you're spending at the desk, but actually what are you achieving? What have you done that day? And that's very easily measurable by what people do in many roles, not every single role. And obviously, if you're chatting with clients, you'll need to do that face to face and so forth. But actually, a lot can get done differently. We just need to think more radically. Um, and that's, I think, the conversation that business leaders need to embark on next um, because they're kind of tiptoeing around the edges of but it. when you're recruiting mm. you know you're, you're 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 looking at people leaving university say and you you have one candidate who is driven hard working ready to give 60 hours a week to your to your business uh to do absolutely everything late nights weekends and all the rest of it and you have another person who comes to you and says well, i'm very clever and i can do what you do but I, you know I, I want my life i want a work-life balance i want to have a relationship i have a child all those sorts of things are you really going to choose that person over the the robot yes because i don't want robots i want people who think laterally and who are but the creative. robot might also um, be very creative i mean yeah i mean be... i just think i think that's a kind of old-fashioned way and they will burn out you know i want someone who ideally is going to work for decades um, and who's going to add something more than just a, I know I'd be more productive I'd come up with the best ideas um, at odd moments of the day I mean it's not because I'm sitting at the same uh, desk now also about recruitment um, again 
everyone talks about diversity, but actually the tendency is for recruiting just for that individual role. Yeah. So, and Andy Haldane, who's an um, economist at the, uh, the Bank of England, came up with a brilliant um, sort of test, the recruitment challenge um, in a speech that he gave, where you say you have two candidates, A and B, like your example, you set them both an aptitude test based on what you need, and one scores eight out of 10, one scores, the other scores four. Most people would just, you know, wouldn't even think about it, they just give the job to the eight out of 10. But he says, what if your existing team also sat the test and they got eight out of 10, right? And they got the same ones, right? It's candidate A, but none of them could get the two right out of the four. Or that's the only numbers that he got right um, for the second candidate. And that's the one you should hire. That's the one who brings something new to the table. But nobody's recruitment process works like that. It's very like courageous that. hiring, though, isn't so, it, to do that. I mean, but it's and people are risk averse, you know, because yeah. they don't want to get in trouble. But I think of, often we think we're being risk averse, but actually we're increasing risk because we've gone through that whole groupthink thing many, many times. And actually, if you do hire people who just agree with you and think alike, then that's what you end up with. So it is a challenge because most people will say, I want people who think differently. I want diversity of thought, not just of you know gender and ethnicity and uh, sexual orientation and so forth, but I actually want diversity of thought. That is really what the stage we have to get to. And in a world where jobs that can be done by algorithms eventually will be done by algorithms, having the most creative teams, the most innovative teams, that is going to be a distinguishing characteristic as a company. So a lot, of, a lot of business leaders are thinking now, they're starting to think about it, the smarter ones are really trying to embrace some of this. I mean, I started that example by saying you've got two people fresh out of university. Is that the first fault as well? I mean, you know, in terms of recruitment, that we expect mm. children to go through this, you know, uh, this, this process of exams, university, mm. do well, get a 2-1, then you can apply for, for, for top jobs. Yeah. Know. Well, I think uh, the funny thing is that actually children or uh, young people at university today don't expect um, the same as we had, which is, you know, you, you work hard, get your decent degree, and you're automatically going to be fine. Obviously, there's a lot of concern about employment prospects, but also there's a realization many are doing postgraduate studies um, if they can, if they can afford to do that, um, and thinking actually it's going to be a lot harder because there is this um, change in how employment is. But they're also thinking they might have two or three goes at a career, you know, the longevity so-called 100-year life, um, means that there's less commitment in their minds, I think, to, you know, not just one company, but one sector. But do you think university actually prepares people for the kinds of jobs that you're recruiting? I think it do varies know, you think you need hugely. To do I, I think it varies hugely. And I actually think, particularly, um, I mean, uh, my elder, older children, um, three out of the four elder ones have gone to university, and the other one is a musician. And she always said she wasn't going to go to university. And obviously, that's a bit different if you're into something creative. But I actually think there are many paths now. And, and I think companies are trying to recruit from uh, A-level students and, and think more laterally uh, at that level, too. And also, later on in life, I mean, we just started with the diversity project, which is something within the fund management industry. And we score very badly on every dimension of diversity but we just started a returnship program. Um, and it's a collective thing because it's really hard for any company to develop a scheme to encourage not just women, but anyone who's taken a career break or wants a career change back in. Uh, you need a lot of systems for that. So we've pulled everybody together and we've got a database. Um, and actually just this last week, uh, the first person on this scheme got a job, um, which is, you know, you've got to start somewhere. So that's exciting. But we need to be uh, have a different approach and not just assume... And I think quite a lot of employers, it's quite difficult to get through the first door now um, with just a standard, even if it's a very strong CV. It's quite difficult. No, exactly. I mean, I was talking to a senior lawyer recently who was saying they, they just don't even bother interviewing people if they didn't get straight A's at A-level and a 2-1 at university. You know, and, and, that, and that if you've had any kind of wobble along your academic career, there needs to be a very good reason for them to even get through the door. And that seems quite yeah. common at sort of top level recruiting now. I'm trying to I'm trying to break that down. I mean, this diversity project has got about 50 companies involved, and what we find again is that there's a real commitment to actually thinking differently. And what we did as an exercise actually was ask all the CEOs or high level uh, people who were part of this um, group to write their CV, their little bio, but not in the glittering accolades and big job titles way but to go through their background, their degree discipline, what they did before joining fund management. And we all agreed that very few of us would make it through our own recruitment 
processes today. Um, and although it's been good to professionalize the industry, it's taken away something. So there's a conscious decision to take away, for example, from our websites, oh, you have to have a 2-1 or higher in maths or economics or finance or business studies. We want philosophers. I mean, I did a philosophy degree. I wouldn't describe myself as a philosopher. But, um, and, and, you know, at one stage I was working very close with someone who done history of art, you know, and you, we do need both. And that's why we, again, get too close-minded if we don't. Um, I do believe that people are keen to change. They're just not following through yet on okay. all the processes. So uh, more diversity, true mm -hmm. diversity, so that's across race, gender, sexuality, disability, all those sorts of things. Less expectation of... Um, you know, a career path in which you have to work non-stop. How else is this new world of work that you think, you know, that we need to rethink different? Well, technology obviously being um, a, a very important uh, third ingredient. I, I recently spoke at Cisco that does all the telepresence. Um, and it was very hard to come up with the example of something that couldn't be done through telepresence, although actually I was slightly nervous about the thought of having that in my own home. Um, but again, I think that's a, that is a very big one. And then the fourth thing I would say would be uh, the realization that uh, diversity is not just a kind of nice to have and it's not about political correctness and it's not about equality, however important some of us might think that, that is. But actually, it is about creating the best uh, results. And that is a real impetus for change that I do think only just realizing, people are just realizing that now. They went through a little bit the motions about you know, women on boards, perhaps in some instances. Um, but people are, are recognizing that actually they have uh, less good teams, less good dynamics if it's, if it's too homogenous. The, the example, I suppose, of, of that is what you've just launched, which is a, a fund um, mm -hmm. which, which promotes um, businesses that have got a good record on, on, on women in, in, the, in, in senior positions, isn't it? If it's the case that diversity delivers results, mm -hmm. is that the best performing fund? Well, it's only just launched, so uh, give us a chance. It's only one day old, so... Uh, but the... Um... There's, there's absolutely no evidence to suggest that any kind of diversity is, is in any way a takeaway. And there's lots of empirical studies that have been done, whether it's globally or on individual countries, um, to suggest that there's a positive correlation between numbers of women on boards and in senior management teams um, and results, financial performance. What you can't ever prove is causality. And I'm enough of a mathematician to know that actually it's really important uh, to emphasize the difference between correlation and causality. Maybe the women are very smart and join the best companies, you know, who knows which way around it goes. But actually I think what I've seen is that the modern enlightened companies about uh, customer behaviors or about threats from competition or about climate change are also the ones that are doing the right thing around diversity. And so I don't think it's a surprise that we tend to see better performance uh, from those companies. We can't prove it, as I say, um, and all this topic, however intensely we feel like we're discussing it now, has really only, I mean, we obviously had the 70s uh, wave of feminism and now it's really in the last you know, decade. Um, and so there isn't a lot of data around women on boards. And there's no control group. You can't say to a certain set of companies, you're not allowed to have any women on these teams and we'll see how you fare compared with the others. So we have to be careful. But uh, uh, the anecdotal evidence, and also from people who have, you wouldn't think they were raising the flag or would raise the flag for women, but actually just say candidly, it's made an impact. Is one of the downsides to the way work is changing the end of job security? Yes, I mean, I think it is a bit of a trade-off um, and also, but it isn't just because of, um, I mean, obviously we've talked very tangentially about artificial intelligence. So we know that there's big shifts in how employment, what are the skills that you need to continue to have a job um, in the next sort of decade, two decades and so forth. No one has a crystal ball. But I actually don't think that we've had real job security in many industries for quite some time. And you might have just had a feeling of the downside. You know, there's job security, but there isn't a kind of changing environment where you can be happier when you actually are in work. And I think we can enjoy changing things so that more people are happier and more productive, have better results, uh, stay longer perhaps if they can, whilst accepting the fact that none of us has a job for life or a career for life. It's, it's going to be, I think, you know, different episodes in our lives when we are part-time, flexible working, full-time, Unemployed. How do you how do you plan a life though in that in that scenario? Mm. How do you buy a house? How do you decide when to have children? Well, I think a lot of the time life takes over you, doesn't it? We can uh, try to plan various things, but, but I mean, it you, you said you were sort of trapped into paying the mortgage yourself. Yeah. I mean, you know, you've lived through an era in pe which people have had relative job security, mm. even in your 
yeah. industry. If that's gone, how, how are people going to make these sorts of commitments? No, I, I, I'm not glossing over the difficulty of that. I think in my own case, all I know is that when I was really feeling financially pressured uh, on behalf of our family, it really did motivate me to do something about my situation, which was at that time being passed over for promotion and therefore not getting the pay rise. I'm not saying we can always control our own destiny. I do think we need to build networks. We need, we, you know, in today's world, we can more easily, I think. And I do think we need supporters. Each of us need people to champion us and to be allies and never to be afraid of asking for help. And, and I'm not saying that will mean you guaranteed never to have any periods of hardship. Um, but it's another reason to say, actually, when you are in work, you know, you repair the roof on the sunny day, you, you save a bit and you invest um, and you try to build some, um, you know, cushion against um, some periods of, of, of perhaps unemployment. I'm not overly, I'm not pessimistic about it. I just think we've got to get used to a, a different way of life. And of course, that shouldn't stop us from living, you know, but it is about being quite self-sufficient and perhaps relying less on one employer. And, uh, and do, do you think we'll have to work for the rest of our lives? I mean, because we won't have pensions, because we'll have short-term, you know, we'll do something for three or four or four mm. years and then do something else, and so um, we'll just have to keep earning money forever? I think in this particular instance, actuarially, as it were, the calculations are I have to work until I'm about 99 because of having nine children. So I'm, I, in my case, it might be working my whole life. But actually, I think, I mean, already we're seeing a much more fluidity, as it were, around retirement. Um, and again, I think... Obviously, everyone's career is a bit different, and people don't necessarily have a career. They have to work, uh, and that's it. And we know we have to work longer to, to be able to afford uh, life after we retire just because we're living longer. You know, there are a number of factors behind that. But again, you know, if we also are able along the way to invest a little bit and to try to grow whatever we can um, set aside from our salary, then that will help. I mean, women at the moment have, when they re get to retirement age, in the UK, pension pots that are one fifth, on average, as the size of the average man's pension pot. Not one fifth less, but one fifth of it. Um, and obviously, that's a huge financial risk. Um, so, it, and it's only going to get worse if we live longer. So, I think we have to accept that we will live long, we will work longer, and and hopefully, if we are happier at work, it won't seem such a daunting prospect. <laughs> when do you see this this world? being a, a real thing? When do you think we'll get there? So everyone has asked me that, and it's if I'm going to have to extrapolate, aren't I? At some point, if we don't get there, I'll have to push it out. I think the gender pay gap will take some time to fix because, I mean, take my own industry. You have to hire more women at the lower end to actually get to equality um, parity um, in 10 years' time. And actually, we're modelling that, and I reckon it will take a decade. Um, in other forms of, you know, more equal workplaces where you'll look around and you'll, it won't feel, I mean, the city feel, still feels very male dominated. I think we're talking about five years, actually. I think the next generation just, coming through. Just on through, gender. Just on gender. And, and then, I mean, you know, so far, and I don't want to make um, any kind of equivalence between the issues that a woman might experience just because she's a woman and someone who's LGBT might experience, um, because uh, that, I think, sometimes would diminish the, the difficulty of being LGBT in certain environments. Um, and they're not all equivalent either. T is much more difficult, say, than the G. But so let's not, you know, denigrate or, or try to gloss over that. But you have um, the tendency you see in companies, they think, well, actually, if we're doing this for women, uh, what other... What, what other dimensions of diversity do we need to address? Um, Lord Brown, the former C CEO of BP, said once, well, we'll have achieved success when women don't have to be honorary men, blacks don't have to be honorary whites, and gays don't have to be honorary straights. And, and that is the goal. The whole way that you want to change the world is, is clearly about persuasion and winning the argument. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite patient. Um, do you do you ever have moments where you just think, oh, you know, why can't we just do this? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, um, particularly because I mean, I, I wrote a book um, that came out and uh, called "A Good Time to Be a Girl: Don't Lean In, Change the System." And it's um, and yet, I, when I've talked about it and my theories and so forth, I certainly feel like a bit of a lone voice in the wilderness that people would rather have a sort of more militant. We're just going to do this. We're going to make this happen. Um, and I, I'm a human being. I sometimes feel, you know, despondent about um, whether one can ever win it sort of one person at a time. But actually, um, I do think it's the only way, ultimately. I think you'll create more resentment, more uh, dis dislocation between the genders or between groups of people um, by sort of 
making people do things, and it won't work in the long term. Uh, we need to make sure that women uh, get the jobs that they are very well qualified for and have the opportunity to do that, but not just to give them it because we've we've decreed it. I mean, that's just not going to be a good advert for for women or for uh, or help society or businesses. So I think it's really important to be a bit patient, but not to leave it like, we've got to accelerate the pace of change and we've got to really create a, a movement now because we have this moment. But you do seem optimistic. I am optimistic, yeah, I am. I mean, I've, I've, partly because of my 30 year career and seeing the hostility and difficulties in the first decade, right through to now where there's huge intent and willingness um, to do this, it's just there isn't quite the matching up with the thinking. Sometimes very easy to slip into, oh, this is just about having a gender initiative or it's about you know running a, a networking group for women women talking to women about women's issues isn't going to do it men and women working together as partners to change things is same helen morrissey thank you very much indeed